So here we are a week before the end of the church year, right? Next Sunday is Christ the King Sunday. And we get a text that we normally have in Advent about people walking in darkness who've seen a great light because light has shone on them and joy is beginning to increase and all of this great stuff is happening. But before we get to the good stuff, we have to talk about walking in darkness. How many of us actually walk in darkness? Metaphorically or actually, Pastor, is what you're thinking right now, right? You're thinking, do, do you mean, do you mean, are we, are we walking in darkness metaphorically or are we walking in darkness, dark, actual darkness, right? How many of you parents have ever walked through your house in the middle of the night that have children that have Legos? <laughs> yeah, hurts. Right? There's a great video out there for that. Anybody, any of you that know there are people that are planning on having children of, of someone getting onto a treadmill and someone standing at the front end of it and pouring Legos on it as they walk on it, right? So preparation for parenthood. Walking in darkness sometimes can hurt, right? Even if you don't have kids with Legos, if you're walking in the dark in your house and somebody moved a stool two inches to the right and you walk into it, it hurts. Walking in darkness can be scary because you don't know what you're going to what you're going to run into or what you're going to step on or what's going to come out of the woods to get you. And, and even if that's not actual darkness and it's metaphorical darkness, it's still scary because we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know how to handle it. And we, we get worked up about it and we don't know what's how life is going to be handled after this point, what's going to happen in these moments and we worry. Is that what God is calling us to do? See, this text is a, is a wonderful text. Because it gives us, the, as I told the kids this morning, it gives us the names of God, right? Which we talked about a little bit at a Bible study, a couple of Bible studies this past week. Um, in, the, in the New Testament breakdown, this is more brought out to be Five different names, right? How many different names of God are there there? As you look at the text, look at the text there, right? We're talking verse six. For, t- for a child has been born to us, a son has been given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named or called. And how many names are there here? Are there four? Anybody see more than that? Could there be a comma? Between, see, see, that's the thing. You, you, can't, you can't go by the punctuation here because the punctuation was added later. When this was actually written, there was no punctuation put in it. So you can't go by what somebody else thought was the way that this was supposed to go. And if you read this about this passage in the New Testament, there's actually five names here. He is to be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There's actually five names here. Well, actually, that's wrong. There is actually four. But why are there four? And actually, I'll read you this passage in a completely different translation here in a little bit. And you'll see there's really only two names here. See, this passage, as we read it in his Bible study, talked about how these people had walked in darkness and now this great joy has come because this baby is coming. And is this the baby that we expect, right? We're waiting. We're not to Advent yet, but we're still waiting, right? You've all already started Christmas preparations. Some people have actually already put up Christmas decorations in their house at this point, sitting in this room. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? <laughs> But we take this passage to be talking about what's going to come at Christmas time, right? Who comes at Christmas? Thank you. That was the answer I was expecting. <laughs> Who actually comes at Christmas? Jesus, right? Jesus comes at Christmas. And we take this Isaiah 9 passage to be this child who is coming unto us. This one who's going to be born is about Jesus, right? It's about Jesus, right? Thank you. 
Are you awake? Come on. I know, I know there's a lot of people missing because they're out trying to, to kill deer, but come on, people. It's about Jesus. And if we look back at chapter 7, chapter 7 has another passage about this, where Isaiah is talking about um, this child that's going to be born in, when he's in the, the courtyard with King Ahaz, and he's talking to the king about how the siege that's on his land is going to be taken care of by the time that this baby, who will be Emmanuel, who will be with us, he, before he can eat curds and honey, the siege on your land is going to be gone. Right? And we get another extension of this here in chapter 9 where Isaiah again says, This baby will be born and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this is about Jesus. And hear me when I say this. I believe that this is about Jesus. But here's the, the thing that this holds is, is if Isaiah is talking to King Ahaz and telling him that as soon as this baby can eat curds and honey, which is when? How many years old does a baby have to be before it can eat honey? Two. One, two, right? Around that time. Curds and honey, one or two. I, I see some nurses arguing with me saying it's one. Um, I'm, I'm going with the biblical answer of two. <laughs> Science has progressed. We've learned new things and, and it's a new age. But So, two years old, roughly. So if, a, if is Isaiah saying to Ahaz, hold on, because the siege to your city is going to be done when this baby can eat curds and honey. And if this is truly only about Jesus, what he's saying to him, Ahaz is, hold on, because in 700 years, this siege is going to be done. Is that good news? Not for Ahaz. <laughs> it is for us, but it's not for Ahaz. The thing that I asked at a couple of my Bible studies this past week is, how many times does a prophecy have to, can a prophet, how many times can a prophecy come true in order for it to still be a prophecy? How many times can a prophecy come true before it ceases to be a prophecy? I don't know if I said that the right way the first time. How many times can a prophecy come true before it ceases to be prophetic? Could Ahaz have been saying, look at this woman, she's going to have a kid, and before this kid can eat curds and honey, the siege on your city is going to be done. And also be knowing that this is about the coming Messiah. You see, we try to put God in a box and say, this passage has to be about Jesus, and it can only be about Jesus. And I'm sorry, but my God's bigger than that, and he's able to do more things than that. My God can take this passage from 700 years before the birth of Christ and have it be about someone then and there, but also have it be about the coming of my Savior. Right? Because those who walked in darkness have seen a great light. How many times over the span of history and over that which is still to come will people be walking in darkness? Every day. <laughs> Every day. There's someone sitting in a close proximity to you today, this morning. I guarantee it that is walking in darkness. They may not show it to you. And you may not be able to tell it. But they are here. And they are walking in that darkness. And they want someone to be that light for them. And that's exactly what God does for us. You see... One of the things that I saw out of a different translation I read out of is wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. One of those translations I read out of in our Bible study said that the names are extra extraordinary strategist. Mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. As the extraordinary strategist. Someone who takes the time to plan out the things, not in an ordinary way, but in a way that is beyond our comprehension for your life. That got me thinking. So then I thought, okay, i got to read this out of a different translation. This translation is the student Jewish study Bible from the Jewish Publication Society. The Tanakh translation. This is just the Old Testament. It's the Old Testament that... Um, Jews would use now in their studies in the temple. And I have to start 
with verse chapter 8, verse 23, to read you the passage for this morning. For if there were to be any break of day for that man, which is in straits, only the former king would have brought abasement to the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, while the latter one would have brought honor to the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a brilliant light. On those who dwelt in a land of gloom, light has dawned. You have magnified that nation, have given a great joy. They have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at reaping time, as they exalt when dividing spoils. For the yoke that they bore, and the stick on their back, the rod of their taskmaster, you have broken as in the day of Midian. Truly all the boot, boots put on to stamp with, and all the garments donned in infamy, have been fed to the flames, devoured by fire. For a child has been born to us, a son has been given us, and authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named. The mighty God is planning grace, the eternal Father, a peaceable ruler. In token of abundant authority and of peace without limit upon David's throne and kingdom, that it may be firmly established in justice and in equity, now and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall bring this to pass. The mighty God is planning grace. The eternal Father, a peaceable ruler. The mighty God is planning grace. And his kingdom will be made upon David's throne and will be established firmly forever in justice and in equity. The verse that really caught my eye, though, even though that, I thought that that was really cool, the mighty God is planning grace. Right? The extraordinary strategist is getting together the things that he's going to do for you. But back that up just a little bit. Truly, all the boots put on to stamp with, and all the garments donned in infamy. Right? What does our verse, version say? For the boots of the tramping warriors and the garments rolled in blood. I instantly, when I saw this, thought, this is not about the self-made person. Truly, all the boots put on to stamp with, and all the garments donned in infamy. Right? If I'm wearing blood-drenched garments, I would be infamous because I would be the one that's still alive. And I would be the one that did it. And it would be up to me to make sure that this continued forward, right? It's talking about a king, about a ruler who's going to rule over their kingdom. But it's not about what this king has done. Because all of that infamy and all of those garments are going to be fed to the fire and the fire devoured by flame. Because it's not about that king. It's about the mighty God that's playing grace. And the eternal Father that's going to rule forever in peace. And God has called each and every one of us to be a follower of Him. To come out of our darkness. To walk with Him through it. Or I should say. God is calling you out of the darkness to walk with Him. God is calling you through the darkness to walk. God is calling you to be a light. And if you've ever walked in darkness, you turn off all the lights in your house and you get ready to walk to your bed. I normally do that when I carry my phone. Imagine that I carry my phone with me. <laughs> right? And if it's completely dark, all you got to do is that. And that's enough light to see. Because just a little bit of light expels the darkness. So don't think you have to be a raging flame. Right? You don't have to be this. You can be this. Because that's what God has called you to do. Later on this morning, you all should have received these little lovely cards. Do you have more of those back there? They're in the pews. You all should have gotten one of these. It's that time of year again. Right? Where we're doing our lovely pledge cards. And I've told several of you, I've told, I know I've told Karen, I think I've told the council, I don't do these things. 
I personally don't do a pledge card. Because I believe what's on this card is between me and God. And I believe what's on this card is between you and God. If this card helps you, though, I want you to fill it out. And I want you to put it in a plate. And if, even if you don't fill it out and put it in the plate, I still want you to fill it out. Right? Because I don't do this card. Because we can't set our budget off of this. Right? Because if we did, we wouldn't do anything. We believe and we walk as people who have come through the darkness. As people who are people of light. Because God has called us to be his children. And through him we will receive joy. And through him we will receive light. And through him we will receive love. And through that we are then called to give beyond ourselves. And so this card for you can be a spark. That helps you remember your light. That helps you to walk through the darkness. That helps you to go into the world and to show them the love that God has given you. Because the... Almighty God is planning grace. Grace upon grace. And because he has graced you, so we need to grace each other. Because he has called us to be a light, we need to share that light with others. One of the things on this card that you might notice, talk, there's, there's a spot down here that says, this is how much I'm going to give, right? There's a spot down here that you're supposed to write in how much you're going to give each week. But there's also this box down here Right below that. If you're looking at it, do you all have these? If you haven't seen one, we have some. They're around here someplace. But underneath the lines where it says, this is how much I'm going to give, there's this little checkbox. And if I do turn one of these in, it'll be with that box check. There'll be nothing written on any of these lines. Um, but any of you want to know what I give, you can ask Perry and Perry can tell you. I don't care. You can know. There's a check box right there that says, We commit, I slash we commit to pray for St. John's Lutheran Church's ministry, the congregation, life, and right? By doing that, you're also helping to spread the light. So if you can't think you can't give anything, you can give something. Because this is about not just financial support, but it's about prayerful support, it's about gift support, it's about knowing who we are in God. And understanding that calling to be a light to the nations. Because God has called us. And he is planning grace for your life. How are you going to share that grace with everyone else?